right, so this is where we left off uh, in the previous lecture. We were talking about meiosis one and independent assortment. So in this scenario, we have a cell that has four chromosomes. That's its diploid number, 2n is equal to four. When the chromosomes have a partner, the number is four. Now, if we divide that by two, we get our haploid number. Our haploid number is really the number of different actual types of chromosomes. And our haploid number here is two. We have pair number one and pair number two, right? That's our, so our haploid number is two chromosomes. And what we're saying in independent assortment is that it's completely random. They made these two different colors on purpose. It's completely random which one of these two lines up on the left versus the right. And so depending on how they line up, the number of possible outcomes in an egg cell or a sperm cell is 2 to the n, n being the haploid number. Um, and so in this case, that would be 2 squared because the haploid number is 2, and there would be four possible outcomes. So here are your four possible outcomes. So you could get one blue, both of the blue chromosomes together. That would be possibility number one. The other possibility, if they line up this way, is possibility number two, that you could get an egg cell that's got the two pink chromosomes. So that right there, that's two different, completely different egg cells that this organism could make that would be carrying different information. Our other scenario is that these two lined up the other way, right? The blue on the left and the pink on the right here, but the pink and the blue are swapped in this one. So now in this scenario, um, when this goes through meiosis one, we get a big blue one and a little pink one. Well, this is possibility number three. This is yet another combination. And they actually use letters for this. Um, when, you're, when you're doing genetics, we use letter for, letters for genes. So this one gave a copy of big A and big B. This one gave a copy of little a and little b. Now, scenario number three, they gave a copy of big A, oops, but little b. And scenario number four, big pink with little blue, they gave a copy of little a and big b. This is actually the basis in genetics for why we make Punnett squares, to represent all the possible outcomes of meiosis. And one of the things we're looking at when we're looking at multiple chromosomes is this thing of independent assortment. So to summarize meiosis one, here we are. I made three pairs of chromosomes in this scenario. So the 2n number for the cell, the diploid number is six, but the haploid number, the number of different pairs, if we divide that by two, our haploid number is going to be three. And so in meiosis one, these chromosomes lined up with their partner side by side. The chromosomes split, the partners split, I should say, and we now have two cells, and each one is haploid. It only has three chromosomes. Now, the chromosomes at this point are still Xs. Now, had this been mitosis, just a reminder of how that would look different, in mitosis, these six chromosomes would have lined up one, two, three, four, five, six, straight down the middle. And the Xs would have split in half. So you would have ended up with one, two, three, four, five, six little sticks here. And one, two, three, four, five, six little sticks here. So we started with six chromosomes. Each of these still has six chromosomes. Because remember, these two chromatids, the two sides of a chromosome, are identical. So if we just split these X's in half, each of these two cells will be identical to each other. And they'll be identical to this cell. They may not look identical to the original cell, but remember, before this cell went through S, that's exactly what this looked like. One, two, three, four, five, six. So these cells are basically identical to this cell, what it looked like before S. This, in this scenario on the left with meiosis, these are not identical to the cell before S. This cell before S, just like the other one, was one, two, three, four, five, six. They became six X's, and now they're going through meiosis. So notice this cell before S looks nothing like the cells at the end of meiosis one. All right, we're going to come back uh, after we talk about meiosis 2. So now in meiosis 2, this is going to be similar to mitosis. This is where your X's, your chromatids, are going to split and become chromosomes on their own. So they're going to split at the centromere. One is going to go to the other, um, to each side. And the chromosome number is not going to get cut in half again. The new cells are going to have the exact same number as the cells they just came from. So I'm going to go back to my picture here and show you meiosis 2. So now in meiosis 2, 
these X's are going to split in half. So we're going to get a stick, a little stick, a long stick, a stick, a little one, and a long one. How many chromosomes are in each of these cells? Three. Just like the cell that they came from. So this is not further cutting the number of chromosomes. Yes, the chromosomes break in half, but remember, each side, each chromatid has a full set of DNA. So each one of these cells still has three chromosomes. And then each of these could then mature into a sperm. So one pre-sperm cell could then go on to make four haploid sperm. So we made four cells in my meiosis. We only made two cells in mitosis. These cells that we made were diploid, and they were identical to each other and to the original cell. These cells are haploid, and they are actually not identical to each other or the original cell. So very, very, very different processes. Now, it does turn out that there is one other caveat to this, and that is that in, yes, in spermatogenesis, which is the making of sperm, you do get four sperm for every pre-sperm cell. However, that is not true for eggs. So it turns out that in the making of eggs, you only make one egg ovum for, for every pre-egg cell. And if you think about this, this would answer a question that might you might think of if you really think about this long enough. If it was true that we made four eggs in meiosis, then wouldn't we make four eggs every month, and wouldn't that mean that we would have babies in sets of fours, that humans would give birth to four babies at a time? Well, we know that's not the case. With the exception of twins, we give birth to one baby. So how is it that we only make one egg a month if meiosis, oogenesis, makes four eggs? And the answer is it doesn't. So what happens is when the eggs divide, the cytoplasm does not divide evenly. And I actually have this on the next slide, so let me just go ahead and go over here. So here is spermatogenesis. So this is your pre-sperm cell. It goes through S. And here's our, uh, now they're only showing four chromosomes. Obviously, if this was a, a sperm, a making a sperm, we would actually start with 46. This is meiosis one. And we would go, in this case, it went from four to two. But in this, but in reality, it would go from 46 to 23. These are called spermatocytes. And then meiosis 2 happens, and the number doesn't change. It would stay 23. Notice it's 2 here. It's still 2 here. They're just sticks instead of Xs. Um, and then each of these matures into a spermatozoa. And you're making, I don't know, thousands of these per day. Now, eggs are a little different. So every month, a female goes through this whole menstrual cycle, right? And on day one of that cycle, that's the first day when this whole ovulation thing starts, you start with an oogonium, which becomes a primary oocyte. The names are not imported. This is still diploid. Again, they're only showing it with four chromosomes, but imagine in us, this would be 46, right? When it goes through meiosis one and, uh, you know, leaves the, uh, the ovary, goes through meiosis one, um, the number would get cut from 46 to 23, but almost all the cytoplasm goes here to this secondary oocyte. That's why this is so much bigger. This one is called a polar body, and although it does have chromosomes in it, it doesn't actually have any of the other cell parts, like all the mitochondria, all the Golgi bodies, all that other stuff. It all went to the other cell. Um, and then when it goes through meiosis 2, uh, the same thing happens again. All the cytoplasm goes to 1. This is called a second polar body. Sometimes they'll show this one dividing again, so that's why I had written that it makes three polar bodies. You may see on some websites that it makes two polar bodies. It depends whether they're going to say that this one divides a second time or not. You're not going to be tested on how many polar bodies. All you really need to understand is that all the cytoplasm goes to one egg, and this, on day 14, this ovum, is what is um, mature and ready to be fertilized by a sperm. Um, the rest disintegrate. And that's why if you've ever seen video of sperm fertilizing an egg, the sperm are, are very, very tiny and they're all like gathered around this egg because the mitochondria and, the, and all the other cell parts are basically provided by the mom, the egg. Um, in fact, mitochondria, you can track mitochondrial DNA maternally back through families. The only thing that, from the sperm that enters the egg are the sperm's 23 chromosomes, the nucleus. The sperm's 23 and the egg's 23 merge together. 
and then we have a fertilized egg that has 46. If somebody has fraternal twins, that is still not because this pre-egg cell split differently. What's happening typically when somebody has, say, um, fraternal twins or, or the octomom who had octuplets or whatever, is that more than the ovary, basically two of these or more of these matured one month. So you still started with two of these eggs or three of these eggs or eight of these eggs that started at 46 and then went to 23. Um, it's still made in normal ovum. And that's what happens when somebody takes fertility drugs. Fertility drugs make you release multiple eggs that month. So you make multiple bees. The, the mature, if multiple eggs mature, you get multiple primary oocytes. Each one of those only makes one egg, one ovum, but you might make two, three, seven, eight of those that month. And then if those get fertilized, that's going to be fraternal twins. Um, if we're talking about identical twins, that's different. You basically have to have the sperm and the egg get together. They fuse. You now have a normal 46 chromosome. Um, this starts to undergo mitosis, forms a ball of cells, and at some point, a piece of those cells break off. Well, each of these, since these came, these came from mitosis, which makes exact copies, these are already for a fertilized egg, each one of these can grow into a baby that's identical. So here's baby one, here's baby two. Technically, if this splits into 12, you'd have 12 babies that were all identical clones of each other because they all came from the same fertilized egg. So that's the difference, is that with identical twins or triplets that are identical, it's happening after fertilization and during the stage of mitosis when the fertilized egg is dividing into a whole ball of identical cells. Each one of these identical cells, since this hasn't actually differentiated into a baby yet, it's just identical cells, each one of these cells can basically grow into a clone or another baby that's identical to the other. So that is, um, that is what happens in meiosis. Now, uh, really quick um, for the lab, for purposes of the, the lab, what happens, how do we get these disorders where somebody has, if you recall, like 47XX plus 21? How do you get a person with an extra chromosome 21? Well, just to show you really quick, here is normal my, my to, uh, meiosis, sorry. We're starting with 46 chromosomes. They line up. I didn't draw all 23, but just pretend. There's 23 pairs here. In meiosis 1, those pairs would separate. You'd end up now, after meiosis 1, with two cells that are haploid. They each have 23 chromosomes. Then the X's would split, and then if this was, say, a male, each of these could develop into a sperm with 23 chromosomes. What happens to give you a baby with Down syndrome or one of these other genetic disorders, trisomy 18 or, or Kleinfelter's XXY, is that during meiosis, two chromosomes get stuck together. This is called non-disjunction. It can actually happen in meiosis 1 or meiosis 2, but in this scenario, I'm showing it in meiosis 1. So these two chromosomes stuck together. So everything is supposed to go half left, half right, but both of these chromosomes are going to go to the left. That means now this, this cell on the left has 24 chromosomes because it has, in this case we're pretending like it's chromosome number 21, it has an extra chromosome number 21. It should only have one copy, it's got two. This cell is missing its chromosome 21. So it only has 22 chromosomes instead of 23. So both of these have the wrong number. Now if these undergo meiosis 2, you now have two cells with 24 chromosomes, because now the X's are going to split, two cells with 22. In this, in this scenario, if a sperm now fertilizes it, let's say this is an egg, if a sperm that has 23 fertilizes this, you're going to have now 47 chromosomes in the baby. And that 47th one would be whichever extra one was stuck. In this scenario, we were saying it was chromosome 21. If it was chromosome 6, you'd have an extra 6. If it was chromosome 12, you'd have an extra 12. Most of these disorders cause such damage that the mom would miscarry. But there are a few of these where the baby can be born, um, and Down syndrome is an example. And then what if this one got fertilized? Well, technically, if this only had 22 chromosomes instead of 23, the baby would only have 45. Um, again, you can't actually live with a missing chromosome with the exception of Turner syndrome where you're missing a sex chromosome. And we're actually going to talk about that in another chapter. But this would not make a viable baby if it was missing chromosome 21.
probably the mom would miscarry. She might not even know she was pregnant. Like the baby just, it just wouldn't develop. The egg would get fertilized, the mom would get her period. She would, she would probably never eat.